you doing here? Bring us some chairs in. All right, well, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, joining us on our anniversary um, anniversary evening. We this started off as four of us, and uh, as you can see, it's not much bigger as the foot. <laughs> um, but um, we started this off a year ago, so if anybody got any questions, we've got Brian, we can know he's, we can see an arm of somebody. I think that's, um, is that Malcolm? Malcolm's arm, we can see. And we've got Mike's here as well. And Mike, Mike yeah, I know Mike, yeah, Mike's on the... Mike can, we have a mic can. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah do, you want to, do you want to give us an introduction of you guys? And um, you say you started a year ago, but how did you all meet? Right, well, uh, myself and AD, the, um, the other, this guy here, and we, we went to the British Constitution Group um, conference last year in November, about a year ago, and we, um, we, were, we were talking and we, we were overheard by somebody who recognised our accents and we decided we were going to start a group. Um, and first, for the first six months, it was myself, AD, um, Lisa who was here and Bex who unfortunately can't be here tonight and it was just four of the four of us um, basically just meeting up and double dating as we used to call it didn't we? <laughs> double dating. So for the first six months it was just four of us and we were sort of sat discussing these sort of issues uh, brought up by UK Colin and um, then suddenly we became seven and then we needed a bigger venue and suddenly then we became sort of 30. It has dropped off in the last couple of months because we've had football on. Football, and we've clashed with the Football England game. So for the last couple of months it has been a little bit more, a little bit quieter. Um, but we have regular members that, that attend. We sit, we have um, talks by various people. We've had John Bravo who's done a talk for us. He's over there. And we have. Uh, <laughs> We've had Rob Freeman, who um, all these videos are uploaded and you can view them on YouTube. Um, and basically, we, do, we just call ourselves the Friends of UK Colin. There's no actual structure to it. We just, um, myself and Amy, we organise for the room to be um, free. And um, we, we sort of send flyers out, you know, emails out to people and say, here we are, free to come along. It will always be free. That's what we've always said, it will always be free and it's all about the information rather than, uh, rather than anything else or any egos or anything like that. So, that is basically where we are. Well, well done guys. Off you go, Brian. Well, I was just going to say, can we thank you all very much because um, it is a really big boost for us when we realise that things are happening out there as a result of what we're doing. And... Um, we're, we're very interested to see that our own group in Plymouth has been growing over the last year. Um, so we've had, most we've had I think is just under 60, and probably we average about 30, 35 now. Um, sometimes people travel quite decent distances, they'll come up from the tip of Cornwall, or we've had people, well we've had people who travel from London and the Midlands as well. Aberdeen. Aberdeen. Aberdeen, yeah, on one occasion, a couple of, uh, flew down from Aberdeen. And it, it does seem that this combination of, um, of having talks and discussing things, but also having a bit of fun and a bit of a laugh and a few beers as well, is, is the way to do it, um, because it, it takes the edge off the serious stuff. Absolutely, absolutely, we, we completely agree. Like when we first started, when it was just, just the four of us, we did say, you know, even if nobody else ever turns up, we're still going to meet, we're still going to attempt to get other people along, and even if it's just four crazy people sat in a, in a, um, in a pub, having a, having a beer and a chat and what have you, that's, that's just what we, we decided that we were going to do. We, we persevered with it. You have to persevere with it. You know, people aren't going to instantly change, you know, and, and see, you know, see the light. And um, also, it's um, it's quite difficult as well because the the information is so so huge and it's so difficult to take in, and the the the, the amount of lies and uh, deception that it, it's going on in the country at the moment, um, it's, it it is quite a matrix to break out of. So we. Um, we, we just kept meeting up, we just kept persevering, and um, we've had, 
Um, we've had 40 members to 40 people, sorry, I keep calling them members, it sounds like we're, we're some sort of structured organisation, but no, we've had 40 people turn up, um, we've had times where there's been 9 or 10, and then, but we sort of average 15 or 20, I think we, I don't know how many people are here tonight, but um, it, it's, um, we average sort of like 15, 20, sometimes we get 30 and up to 40 people, so obviously not as big as your group down in Plymouth, um, but we're sort of a little bit more easily accessible than Plymouth from uh, South Yorkshire. So, how's the weather down there anyway? <laughs> it's cold. Sorry, it's cold. It's, um, it's cold, misty, dark. Um, yeah, we're, we're ready for a Devon winter, basically. Oh, nice one. Cameron's underpants, isn't it? Oh, black and blue. So, keep going. Do you guys go out leafleting and um, and sort of waking people up around there, or what do you what do you do? Well, what we we uh, what we try to do is we try to use the things that we we've got at our fingertips, the things that, that, that are there to spy on us, really, such as Facebook, um, Twitter, things like that, and we try to get the word out. I mean, leaflet, physically leafleting again, a lot of um, sorry, Aidan. Yeah, yeah, sorry, we, we, did, um, we did gain a lot of members when Ian Crane was speaking next door, but one to this building in Sheffield. Uh, when was that, Ada? Yeah, about six months ago. So what we did is we, we went along to Ian Crane's meeting because we thought there'd be a lot of like-minded people there. And um, we leafleted there and we gained quite a few contacts and, and people that, that att attend occasionally and some people that attend you know, um, regularly. Um, so, yeah, we, we, but we've, we've got a word of living as well. I mean, I, myself and Amy both work, so we're booked. Um, we, we do try to, um, we try to do whatever we can using the tools that are available to us, you know, at, at the, this particular moment in time. Yeah, yeah, Ian's, Ian's actually been here today. He did his uh, fracking show because yesterday he got um, stuck in traffic when it was supposed to happen. So Ian's been down here today and um, he's now going to have a, a regular slot once a week, uh, maybe more at some point. And, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of now fully on board with us. And we're, we're lucky because we all live in the same area. Um, I've known Ian Crane for quite a few years before I, before I even joined the column. It's kind of Ian who kind of hooks Brian and I up, and um, yeah, he's a good man, he knows his stuff, and a fabulous speaker, so um, yeah, well done for, for getting him down, getting him up there. Yeah, well, he, I mean, he was, uh, he was booked up here anyway, I mean, we just noticed on his itinerary that he was coming to Sheffield and that he was going to be in, I think it was the Novotel, wasn't it, the Novotel, which is only two doors away from, from this particular venue that we've got here, that we, that we use very kindly, they allow us to use here. Yeah. Um, all for free as well, so it's just it's just about getting there, and talking to people, asking um, asking pertinent questions. If somebody has some sort of point of view or something, then they're just challenging them on it. Um, and th this is the thing that we try to do. And I woke Amy up. Um, must what is it now? About eighteen months. About eighteen months ago, and he came in six months. It, the amount that it taken me six years to learn. I mean, the, the, it's not only now that people are waking up, it's also the speed that people are waking up. The, 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 um, it's not taking as long as it did. When I first woke up in 2006, um, and, and again, I hate that expression, waking up, but it's just the only one that you really you can use um, that people understand. But when I woke up in 2006, in, the amount of information that was available then was nothing compared to the information available now. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's really any excuse other than willful ignorance um, for people to not exactly know what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a, we've got a little group near here, um, down, well, it's down in Cornwall. They start up a bit like themselves in a, in, in a little park. And they they meet what four nine isn't it? Cornwall yeah. 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 And then some of them just wrote out some bits of paper, um, just on just the general things, like a vaccine or maybe chemtrails and health health issues. And they just they went around um, Penzance for the day and handed them out. And now the group has grown to this 
Well, it's a full house, isn't it, when we've gone down there? Yeah, I think one of, one of the tools we... Sorry. Sorry, I think one of the talks that uh, we did down there, there was about 80, 85 people, and certainly when Ian Crane went down, they, uh, they, they were over 100, so the room was um, absolutely packed. And that's now gone from uh, Penzance to them forming a Cornwall Truth Group, and they've started to bring in people from other areas of Cornwall. And I, I can tell you that, um, well, Cornwall's a very sort of tight-knit place. People know each other. There's a lot of families there who've lived there for sort of generations, and they've got cousins and distant cousins all over the place. So it's a county, but it's also quite quite a close-knit community. And um, it's clear that things are beginning to spread. And uh, I had an email a couple of days ago um, from a retired Cornwall County Councillor, a lady who I haven't spoken to for probably about two years, and um, she said that they've been watching the UK column broadcasts and um, they were interested in all the stuff we were talking about, but they've got a problem that had come up with um, a waste, a landfill site at St Dennis, and it, this, this was causing a lot of problems and um, the, the local people were looking for ways to get, get out the truth about what was going on. And so she said, I decided to get back in contact with the UK column. And would you be interested in talking to us and, and you know, broadcasting it? So I've said yes, of course. Uh, but it was very interesting for me that um, a retired Cornwall County Councillor has uh, picked up and has obviously been doing more than just sort of recommending us to, to their friends. So I, I, I totally agree with you that I think there's a, a change in people and you can, you can feel it locally when you talk to people. A lot of it's to do with problems. Um, people have been made unemployed or they know people who've lost their jobs um, or people are starting to find a pinch uh, to experience a pinch with money and that is getting them a little bit angry, they're a bit unsettled, but they're asking questions. Um, for me, uh, probably one of the best ones is my local post office where the lady four years ago didn't really know very much, but we've had a lot of conversations and then she said to me the other day in front of a queue of people in her post office, what's the matter with people? Why, why don't they see what's going on? And it was just, it was brilliant because she's come from nowhere in four years, she's learned a lot and now she's getting frustrated that other people don't know what's going on. Yes, I think that we, we all um, we all feel that frustration when you when you when you try to talk to somebody um, um, and they they're absolutely just completely either I, 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 I actually can't understand why how people can live in this system and just allow the system to continue to, to I know it's a terrible word but the, the system's raping people you know your money is is being taken. If it's not taken from one place, it's taken from another. It's, it, it seems it's all about how much money um, the, the, the establishment, the, the system, if you will, can take uh, from people at, at, at any particular point in time. Just anything whatsoever. So I was just wondering, sorry, I'm just, um, no, if you want to carry on. No, no, go on, go on. Uh, but I was just going to ask if anybody got any questions. Just, sorry, hang on, just a second. Hi, Brian, my name's Paul. Uh, would you say that the um, feudal systems are alive and well? The feudal system, did yeah. you say? Yeah, it's alive and um, well. Yeah, yes, I, I think I'm more and more convinced that that's pretty close to what we're looking at. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been paying close attention to over the last few weeks is what the Privy Council has been doing in relation to uh, Leveson and, and the, the attempts obviously to uh, take control of the mainstream press and media and 
if you just do some basic research on, on the Privy Council website itself and Wikipedia, you don't need to go too far because it, it's right in your face. But you've got this secret group of, sorry, secretive group of, of very privileged people, so all the right honourable MPs, um, of course David Cameron and Miliband and Nick Clegg, um, are simply voted into this chamber uh, where secret discussions going on go on. I read tonight that in fact they don't even have any formal meetings in, in the sense that most people would regard a meeting with perhaps people sitting down around the table and discussing something and then minutes being produced. Apparently the three or four people uh, who go into the meeting uh, are some of the quite short notice and they simply stand there and the decision is made because it's three or four people that the Privy Council says is a quorum. So if we look at it from our point of view, the peasants, we have these people that are appointed into that closed door meeting by a system we don't even understand, but once they're in there, they've got the powers to make um, draconian decisions about how we're going to live our, live our lives. And of course, um, Cameron, which we just touched on with the news today, was in the Lord Mayor's banquet, so you, you see a room full overwhelmingly of very uh, wealthy and affluent people deciding what the fate for the rest of us should be. And of course, Cameron is now quite happy to say, well, it's not just we're going to have austerity for a few years, we're going to have austerity um, in perpetuity. Thank you, having trouble with my words tonight. And I've only had, I've only had one small beer. Um, so, yeah, well, the more I look at it, the more I, I think, yes, we're moving into, we can call it a dictatorship, but of course it's got all the pomp and ceremony of some sort of feudal system because we've got um, a monarchy that are unbelievably wealthy. Some people say, well, it's the Queen who's, who is the most wealthy person in the world. I don't know whether that's true, but she's certainly a billionaire. And then we've got people who can't feed themselves and they've nowhere to sleep. That's got to be a feudal system, I think. Yeah. And bearing in mind they're throwing away food as well when people can't feed themselves. I'm, I'm well aware of the, uh, of the ancestral heritage of those people. And would it be fair to say that the Romans never left? <laughs> well, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, if we get to the subject of who we're actually up against, it's, it's obviously clear if we just stick to interesting stuff, so we're just having a bit of discussion, but from my point of view, it's clear that um, family allegiances and the bloodlines are part of it. Um, but then we've got some interesting things. On one hand, you can, you can look at things and say, well, it's quite clear that the Catholic Church has got a, a huge amount of power and um, we could have some discussion about why Scotland is quite so powerful at the moment. I think largely due to a Catholic influence. But of course, if we talk Catholics, we're not talking about ordinary Catholics. We're talking about something akin to the, um, the Vatican. And that brings us towards the, absolutely towards the Jesuits. Uh, but the other thing that um, I, I'm going to say I'm a little careful on talking about, but it's clearly under the surface, is that as we delve into this thing, the information we get um, uh, takes us more and more towards some very dark subjects. Um, now, I don't know quite what, what your audience is, so I'm going to be a little bit in the middle. But um, the moment we start heading in the direction of the abuse of children, we're starting to see something which I don't think is connected back to the Romans still being here. I think we're talking about an ideology which is sort of evil in its own right. And uh, we're... 
Well, I was just going to say, it surpasses Roman. It's, it's, it's older than, than the Romans. It's much, much older. You know, you, you look at our culture, you look at Roman culture, you can, you can, you can certainly see similarities. But then if you go beyond, beyond and further back, even, even to the Sumerians and so forth, similar culture there, similar sort of behavior with young people. I mean, you know, Babylonian, well, I mean, no idea, yeah, absolutely. I suppose you couldn't really say one about the other. Um, so, I'm, well, just adding to what Brian said, I would say that it just it surpasses Roman Hood and it's much bigger and much further. Could you tell me what your reaction to that is? What, what do people in your audience think? Myself, I'm in full agreement with you that it does stand back a lot further than what they um, seem to allow us to know. Um, I can't talk about what, what's really controlling them, but if you look to some people, uh, one called Scott Ritter, which you're probably aware of, you went weapons inspector, and then Phil Schneider, I think you'll find uh, influences coming from them, particularly about the um, audience he had with the UN and 40 of his uh, parties and they were telling them telling that they can't barely defend themselves and he, and he mentioned that a, a group sat by with were dictating policy to well-known UN representatives in the room and it was not of the same species. Well, the, the, the UN the UN is an easy one to deal with because if you if you delve into the history of the UN, um, they are clearly telling us what they're about. And of course, um, one of the easy places to go is what what is now the Lucifer Trust. Previously, it was the Lucifer Publishing Company, which was the UN's uh, publishing company for documents. Um, now you could say that's a bit of a coincidence, but I think there's more to it than that. And it's clear that most of the, um, uh, I, I'll use the word dangerous, the most dangerous political agenda that, that's slowly wrapping itself around us is coming from the United Nations. So whether it's control of the world's population, or it's a clear move to a one world religion, or it's the fact that all children are to be brought up by the state, um, or the fact that people are to be moved off the land under Agenda 21. All of that policy is, is coming from the UN. And in fact, we've got a, a little team of very good researchers working on, on the UN and the, and the world governance aspect, uh, some of whom are based in, in South Wales, and they have been warning for some time now that UN um, policy and the UN agenda is coming straight into local communities via the public sector. It isn't even going anywhere near Westminster. So you're finding that local councils are implementing policies. Um, an example would be ultimately that uh, we're now taking bedrooms away from people uh, because where we're going to go is that you will only be able to have a dwelling to meet your immediate needs. If you're a single person, you just get one bedroom. Um, and ultimately, the state will own the housing. So these sorts of policies are coming straight out of the UN. And the other, the other area, if people want to research around the UN, then you should go towards... Um, uh, mental hygiene and the World's Health Organization, where in fact the undertone is all to do with mental health uh, under the pretext that we are not mentally healthy unless we simply accept a one world system of government and we all in general have a hive mind to follow what they suggest. Brian, when you, when you speak of um, council, can you change that thought pattern into um, feudal landlords collection on, including the local police service, which work for the council? Um, I, I've had um, one or two discussions with them and I've found that information is passed via the council directly to the local police forces. I've even had police enter my property when I've been asleep at night. I don't know how they've got a key, but they come in 
they've walked in. I had four years of them threatening me oh, over lots of different things. It, it went national what happened to me as well. Well, I, um, we certainly know that the, um, uh, the cooperation, the collaboration between lo local authorities and uh, the police is at that level. Um, if, if we want to keep it at, in areas where we can sort of look at the evidence as to what's, um, how this is being organised, then we probably want to go to MAPA, M-A-P-P-A, the Multi-Agency Public Protection Arrangement, uh, because that is the official uh, working group by which, uh, within an area, and there are, f I think there are 63 designated mapper areas in the uh, UK, uh, and within each mapper uh, meeting or mapper group, individuals who are perceived to be a problem to their community or to the local authority or to the police or to anybody else are discussed and they decide behind closed doors what, what actions are to be taken. So the mapper system is very, very dangerous because the discussions of the mapper teams, as I say, are done behind closed doors. There are no minutes. And the only way you would actually find that you were of interest to the mapper team was probably to get a visit from the police as, as you have. Um, this is, you know, this is very akin to the Stasi or the East German state. Thanks, Malcolm. And um, it's already in position in this country. Um, I certainly know two people um, who ultimately have letters from their GPs. Uh, I'll deal with one man because I remember that one the best. But basically, he had been writing some fairly uh, caustic letters to, uh, amongst others, Theresa May. And um, one day he got a call from his GP surgery saying, could you come in and see the doctor? And he asked why, and they wouldn't give him a very clear answer. He, he decided he would go in to see his GP because he was curious. And he said he went in and sat down in front of the GP, who looked slightly embarrassed and squirmed on his seat. So eventually the guy said, well, okay, I'm here. Why do you want to see me? And the GP looked very embarrassed and said, well, we've, uh, I've had a letter from the, the Home Office and they've asked me to interview you to see whether everything is okay, including your mental health. And this had come from a referral from his local mapper area through to the Fixated Threat Assessment Centre, uh, as was, which was a collaboration between selected police officers and a team of psychiatrists and they were based in, in London and their job was to protect politicians and, and celebrities from members of the public that they felt may be dangerous to them and you know Malcolm said East Germany well this is East Germany operating in this country in 2013 and most people simply have no idea these organisations are in place. Hi, this is Ed. Um, I think I'm stuck where the camera can see me. Um, move to the camera, yeah, I'm coming here. Um, 1972 took us into Europe, Treaty of Rome. Since then, there's been, what, five, six more treaties signed, and there's supposed to be something like 80% of perceived political power taken from. Um, our government, if you like, and take it over to Europe. Yet we still find people who totally believe that they, um, that the politicians are actually answerable to them, that there is a difference between one colour or one direction and the other, and that them actually putting across on a piece of paper makes any difference whatsoever. Um, when you hear stories that <laughs> that you've just said, Brian, if that had come from almost anybody else's mouth, I'd have said, you've got to be joking. So, um, and you just really don't, don't really want to say it. It's like East Germany times 10. Um, and when you sort of look at what's happening, and, but all we're trying to do here is to wake people up with that horrible saying and just say, look, do you really believe that politicians are actually answerable to you? Surely it's the banks. That's who they answer to, because that's, 
that's who they answer to. And if you look, and, you know, two, three hundred people own almost all the big corporations. Uh, does it make a difference whether the gas companies that sell you the gas or the gas companies that dig it out of the ground have got a different name? If the same people at the top, what the hell does it matter? I think a good way to start is um, by just reminding people that their, their pays are being frozen, but the politicians have demanded an 11% pay rise, and they, sorry, and the Queen actually 22%. But the, the politicians 11% pay rise and they want to keep their expenses, i.e. hotel bills, second homes, um, tea biscuits, etc. And while the rest of the country are having their pay frozen and pensioners are going without heating over the winter, but these guys sitting in Parliament making up these rules for us are rewarding themselves. I think they're now up to about £78,000 a year that their, their salaries have gone up to. So that is always a good thing to get to, to get people thinking. It's one in an area of Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a question to pose, though. Mm. How how is that how is that right that these people who should be working for us have rewarded themselves with this, this type of money? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it's whatever you see a little opening in, you know, regardless of health. I mean, everyone can relate to the health side of things because it affects everyone. So there is that opportunity, but it, it's worth. It is worth reminding people that that's what they've given themselves at eleven percent, and the Queen twenty-two percent. Yeah, well, she could sell one of the wheels off a gold carriage and feed the whole of South Yorkshire for three years. She could feed the whole of the world. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if, the, if her and the Vatican are so worried about all these poor children, often of, uh, off of a different colour dyed in all these other countries, they could just part with some of that gold. But anyway. Just, um, if I may, while it pops into my mind, because we're on the subject of the yeah. Queen, and you, you've mentioned, um, well, we, we've talked a little bit about the Catholic Church. I'm um, just going to stress, um, we're working with all sorts of uh, people, so this is a, a learning process. Caveat accepted. I've said to many people that, that I believe the head of the um, Church of England for several years is effectively Satan, a satanic head, and I'm happy to debate that. Um, so, but we're, we're talking about the wider power of the Vatican and the Catholic Church. Um, we were told some time ago and I am very sure the information is correct that the Queen has visited the Pope on two occasions and kissed the papal ring, which is pure subservience to the Pope. So I, I believe that this royal family is already uh, subservient to the Vatican and has been for, for a very long time. So that, that is a, a straight deception going on on a... On a um, what's the word? It, it's visible. Yes. We don't, we don't have to go into terms of theories. Um, but the, the man who pointed it out to me uh, said if, if you did actually follow through on mainstream news reports, you, you could actually track down when the visits were. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've always found that quite interesting. Paul Lemon, um, who spoke just before I did, uh, pointed out a f if you actually go to Google Earth and look at the Vatican Square from above, you, you're actually, the people stood in the square actually stood on the Union Jack. Yeah, that's right, no, that's right. Um, so, while we're on the church, seeing as we're here, um, it's pretty obvious that the church has obviously been dismantled. I mean, myself, I'm not a religious person, but it is still pretty clear. We're talking about the, so the head of the, 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 the Protestant church kissing the papal ring. You know, we've, we've then got uh, uh, a Jew who's basically the, the Archbishop of Canterbury who is now turning the church into a, into a payday loan company. Absolutely. Pope's a Jesuit. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, we're, yeah. Talking, we're talking about England here. We're, you know, we're talking about the, the, you know, the, the English church. You know, and so you, you, have, you have this man who's, who's basically turning the church into, into a payday loans company. He's promoting homosexuality. I mean, all of these things, whilst we can debate about these things on a personal level, all of these things are actually against what the church teaches. So, you know, it's no coincidence you have a country that's being dismantled from the inside out, whilst at the same time the very foundation of the law of this country, which comes from the, from the Bible and the church, is being dismantled as well, and it's basically being turned on its head. And I would agree with Brian that I would say that the satanic cult is very much at the head of the church. Absolutely. Very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've got John with me, who's uh, uh, one of the crew here. He'd like to ask a question. 
Hello, I'm known as uh, John Bravo. Hello to everyone there tonight. Hi, John. Hello. You guys speaking okay down there in Plymouth? We go. Yeah, so, sometimes, we, we, sometimes we wish we were a bit further north, because Plymouth's miles from anywhere. Um, so we could do with re relocating to Bristol or somewhere like that, so you guys are a very long way away from us. Well, my question for you guys tonight was, I see either every day or every other day, uh, either a video, you're normally a video, um, of somebody either stopping an eviction, or um, stopping a bailiff, or chasing off a TV license goon, or standing up to a parking inspector or a police officer, and I see it a lot. I was just wondering how much of it you guys see in terms of, you know, do you get lots of emails about this? I mean, what, what's the word on the street? Um, yes, we, we know this is going on, and I thought what you were going to say to us is, why aren't we showing it? And my answer to that was going to be, we, we are, we are heading in this direction, whereas, as, um, in addition to talking about what's happening, we want to also be broadcasting the good news of what people are doing to stand up to it. So, uh, we haven't quite, we haven't quite got there yet, um, but shortly we, we hope to be, to be able to be devoting time to positive things of what people are doing. Um, but I'll just, I can say that um, Mike and myself had an um, interesting experience helping somebody stand up against the bailiffs uh, probably about a year ago, which was successful because they eventually unclamped the vehicle and left. And we think they left mainly because um, although there was a certain amount of um, documentary challenge being given to them by Kate, uh, who also works uh, here with us. Um, the bailiffs clearly didn't like it when we, we were asking for details of their bosses and how much how much space they wanted on the front page. So we, we, um, we've experienced it live ourselves and in fact um, Louise here had a, a, a little bit of trouble the other night which I don't know whether she does or doesn't want to speak about but um, she had some particularly uh, aggressive people at her door and um, Malcolm has also talked to other people. Uh, well, no, I've, I've done quite a bit of stuff on my own, but I mean, I've, if you guys want to know about that, you can, you can... No, no, if you guys are interested and you want to know about the court stuff, that's fine. I just, I just wanted to just add, um, when you were talking about the stuff that we're going to be showing, um, we, we get a lot of people, or well, certainly I get a lot of emails from people asking why we don't give um, enough practical solutions. And, and it is a very fair point, and I think it should be addressed, but... I would simply say that I, I don't think that UK Con really has enough. We, we, we shouldn't really tell people what they should and or shouldn't do. One thing I'm, and me and Mike have talked about it at length over the last few days, one thing I'm really wary of at the moment is how the old system is emerging into the alternative media. So you have certain cult celebrities now in, in the mainstream media. I'm sat next to one of them, right? <laughs> Are you joking? Are you joking? No, but seriously, you have, you have big cult, cult, cult leaders like Ike and, and, and Jones and so forth and they're providing a focal point for people to follow. And I'm really wary, because one of my favorite stories as a child was the Pied Piper, and I'm really wary of those sorts of characters. And so I, I, I think it's a thin line for UK Con to walk. We don't want to tell people what they should or shouldn't be doing, but at the same time, we do want to show the courageous stuff that people are doing, because that's fantastic. Um, that's really what I, what I wanted to add, because as I say, we get a lot of people asking us to give them practical solutions, and, and I for one really think that the solution isn't going to come from one person or one group, it's, it's got to come from all of us, and we've all got to take our own steps to do what we can do in our own time with the limited resources that every single one of us has, and it's a case-by-case -case scenario, I think. Thanks for that. The, the question was more, no, I didn't mean to say, you know, why aren't you putting it on the show, the question was more, you know, how many times do you think this is happening in a week? Like, for instance, do you hear about a thousand cases or ten thousand cases? I wanted to know how big you think the, the, the rebellion movement to bailiffs and police and um, evictions is. You know, if you... it, it, well, it's getting, I know for a fact it's getting a lot bigger because um, the original um, video that went out that I first saw was a guy called uh, Lawrence Eastman and he stopped the guys in Barnet going in. It's people versus the banks. And that video kind of um, was the forefront for other people to, to start doing it themselves. 
there's groups being set up in Manchester, we know that for a fact, you know, a, a friend of mine's involved, people phone them up, and that, you know, a group of them end up going around to the house and stopping evictions, and there are small group groups in, in many areas now that are doing it. So I think it is happening regularly. I couldn't put a figure on how much it is happening, but I know there are groups being set up weekly um, to, to help people for when bailiffs do turn up and uh, try and get enter into properties. I, you know, as I said, I had a horrible one turn up at my front door at six o'clock while I'm trying to feed my children and refused to go. Um, but we just, yeah, we just, um, we shut the door and um, just let things take its course. But I mean, there are many, many groups um, starting up and there are more and more people waking up. Even at the school gate this afternoon, one of, the, one of the dads said to me about them, that he had someone turn up at the farm and he, he knows how, how to handle it. Whatever you do, don't sign any piece of paper because then you're in, into a contract with them. You know, shut the doors, shut your windows, lock the doors and... Um, they can't come in. Yeah. Get your camera phone out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've just turned to that. I had a call from a, a guy in uh, Ireland. Um, so I lost track of the day. So it must have been about Thursday last week. And um, he had recently found out about us. And he told me that um, he, he was a, a small landlord. So he owned 10 properties. But he was now with a group of people and they've all put their properties into a trust and uh, were also running a, a group that was um, helping people defend against bailiffs in Ireland. So th this is the sort of, we, we can't say how many in a numerical sense, but we are seeing more and more, okay, the videos that you guys are seeing and, and we get more and more calls here which are positive. If we go back say two years ago, most people who called the column uh, had either got a problem or they could see what was going on and they were worried, some of them pretty scared, they'd sort of suddenly realised something nasty was going on. Now, the balance is probably 50-50 with people who've got problems and other people who may say they've got a problem but they then say what they've done about it that they've, um, they've started going to court or they're working with other people. So we're seeing, I hate the term because the other side uses it, but it's in empowerment. We are seeing people now starting to stand up for themselves. And the beauty of this is that once they've done it, they really feel good about themselves and you see them uh, not only helping themselves, they start to help other people. So I, I think um, yeah, it would be nice to say that there are sort of 5,000 people acting against the bailiffs every six months. Can't give you that figure, but, but we can tell from the calls and the emails and texts and things we're getting that uh, the tide is beginning to turn. I, I describe it that we're, we've started skirmishes in the battle, whereas before uh, you know, the army was still in their tents asleep. Now, finally, we've got some people who are actually out there fighting in the right way, non-violent way. Yeah, this, this is aid again. Um, from my point of view, it's all about giving people the opportunity and the thought that actually they can say no, they can question things, and just because somebody who's supposed to be of higher authority, I don't have any problem with authority, I just have the problem with that anybody thinks they might need some over me. Because I'm not going to hurt anybody, I'm certainly not going to steal from anybody. So why does anybody need any authority over anybody? Unless it's in their own interest. One thing that struck me at the BCG conference just over a year ago, which is when Jason and I and uh, the others first got together, was that without any question, everybody that I spoke to in that room of a few hundred people I don't think there was anybody there who hadn't had something nasty happen to them. Be it bailiffs, be it the authorities saying they couldn't build on their own land, where I was used to be. I mean, Jason and I spent 10 minutes talking to one guy. He had got nothing left. His grandmother had left him some land uh, to build a house on, and every piece of money that he'd got in order to build that house had gone on red tape. Just because they just didn't want it. And all they wanted to do was have a few chickens and a house. And if a man can't even do that and just live on his own land, land and live happily, then there's something seriously wrong in this world. And if you look around the room here, 
the, 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 there's people, I mean, there's more people than you can actually see on the camera. There's paperwork on, on a couple of the tables, and almost everybody that I've spoken to in the room on previous meetings has all come up with something they've got going on with some authority, be it the parking, be it the police, be it the council. I mean, I've got one going for one of my friends at the moment. Um, the local council now owes 4,000 quid because they said that we owe them 80, so that'd be funny if it ever goes to court. Um, and, and people certainly now standing up and, and saying no. Why should we have to take this crap? Because that's basically there's more crap to deal with. Just forget about the crap, and that's what we always want to be left alone. And I, I don't think there's anybody here who's got any malice. They just want to be left alone. Just let me, you know, leave me alone a bit in my life and be gone with it. Um, enough of me. Who else would like the next question? Well, I just I just add to that, just say that uh, that's not going to happen. First and foremost, we're not going to be left alone, so, you know, we've got to deal with this one way or another, so we can either put our heads in the sand, but obviously all of us present here today are not going to put our heads in the sand, so that's that. Over. I just wanted to, because your comment touched on the first uh, comment that Jason made about people and, and the frustration we all feel because we're trying to get people to realise what's happening, and we can't, and we get frustrated sometimes. I think it's really important to remember that every single one of us, every single one of us was in that situation. That might have been five years ago, might have been ten years ago, we might have been screwed up as Mike, that might even have been 15 years ago, but even 20 years ago, Mike was in the system. All of us were in the system at one time. You know, so A, that should give us a lot more patience with the people we're dealing with because we're just, you know, they're just like, well, we, you know, in the same position we were. But also, that it's, it's a process, isn't it? It's a process that all of us have gone through. We're all stronger because of this process, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. But the important thing to remember is, like you say, everybody there, or everybody present in your room, and everybody present here, has felt the wrath of the system. And we have to have that bubble popped in order for us to see the real world, right? Because the rest of us are just going around with a bubble, you know, we're trapped in this bubble, we can't see it, and we won't see it until that bubble bursts. So, I, for one, don't actually think austerity is a bad thing. I think it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that every single one of us has to be able to reach out to people we wouldn't ordinarily be able to reach out to because their bubbles are popping. So I, for one, am very optimistic at this moment in time. And um, I think that with all you guys there, you've got the paperwork on there, you've got enough heads to bang together to find solutions. I think, you know, we're all heading in the right direction and we should all, you know, we should all keep our spirits up on that. Can you hear me? Yes. Just a bit. Uh, it's, uh, this is Ian uh, speaking. Um, we've had letters from the energy companies um, saying that they're going to um, roll out smart meters next year. And I was wondering what, uh, what, what you thought, what the real reason is for this. What, what's really behind this, do you think? And where do, where do we stand on this? You know, depending on whether you live in a private house or whether you live in a council house, you know. I was just wondering what your thoughts on that was. Mike's probably the best one, but I mean, I've had many chats with the guys who set up smartmeters.co, stop, stop, smartmeters.co.uk, and I believe if you're a, a tenant in a council house, we don't have a choice because it is their property and uh, I think the reason they're doing it is so they can full, full control but I think Mike's the best one to uh, answer your question. No, I don't think I am, I think... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you go for it anyway, Mike. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, smart leaders enable them to um, understand exactly how people are using their energy even down to the point of understanding what utilities people are using and what... Uh, um, yeah, utilities in their homes people are using, um, they allow them to switch off your energy remotely. They don't have to send people out to read your meter anymore. Uh, there's a massive uh, profiling and um, spying operation uh, as part of that. Um, it gives them a level of control that they've never had before because, because before if they wanted to cut you off, they had to, um, they had to actually um, send somebody out to do that. They're not going to have to do that. I actually think that it's not just going to be publicly owned uh, housing that's going to be susceptible to this. Of course, anybody that's a tenant uh, is going to be, has really got no choice about what type of meter is installed. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's going to get to the point where in the not-too-distant future, 
the energy companies have got to say, well, if you want us to supply energy at all, you've got to take one of these. Um, they, the, energy, the, the energy companies at the moment, if you look at their, the way they're behaving, they're, um, they're stealing people's money, they're overcharging people, and they're trying to put people on direct debit payments, which means that they take a fixed amount every month, and they try to run people's uh, accounts and credit. Uh, and that means that uh, at the end of um, at the end of a quarter, at the end of a year, they may have several hundred pounds. Up to me, at one point, British Gas had uh, about three hundred and fifty pounds of my money, which they were rather reluctantly giving me back. Um, but nonetheless, they had it for quite a period, an extended period of time, which time and over which time they were clearly making interest on it. Even though I probably wouldn't have, because my bank doesn't, you know, banks aren't paying any interest at the moment. But you know, the point the point here is that that uh, uh, the utility companies are um, using this as an excuse, as, as a problem that they're going to provide a solution to. The problem is that they're taking your money uh, and they're they're holding on to it. Well, at some point, enough people are going to complain about that. They're going to say, well, you know, have a smart meter, and then we know exactly how much money to take each month. Um, so they're, they're starting to sell smart meters, and we, we understand the, the health implications of these, but I think the health implications are only one, one well, they are huge, but they're only one aspect of it. Uh, the, the, the control aspect is the main, the main reason for it. Yeah. I think as well that uh, one of the reasons for these smart meters is that uh, if anybody's studied um, cancer, and in particular, um, medicine that actually treats and cures cancer and know how that medicine is grown and that you need certain um, energy signatures that are 12 hours on and 12 hours off that can easily stop that medicine. That, that's one of the reasons I personally think it's happening. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I, don't know. I, mean, I, I think there's more about the whole control personally. I, I see what you're saying and understand what you're saying. That could possibly be a factor, but I think it is more about control, as Mike said, the whole money side of things, and to monitor what you're doing and to, to see, to spy what you're doing. And again, if you're naughty, they've just got the power just like that, they can just flick the switch. <laughs> I think it's important to remember as well that it, it, you know, it's a psychopathic regime that's, that's basically emerging. And you know, and one element of that is basically you know ultra control. And so I, I would echo really what, what Lou is saying um, because we've got to think about the world that is being that is sort of being created, and that world is going to be completely controlled and owned by a private organisation. And so, a private organisation isn't going to be able to rely on any government bodies or anything like that. You know, for for, for, for the systems being brought in, you know, they want they want to completely automate the system that could be run by machines because they don't need to employ anybody. So I think the smart meter really plays into that. I totally understand what you're saying about the, the cancer element, and I think that the, the health issue is certainly, from their perspective, a, a bonus because you know, obviously they, they, they want the strength to on the NHS and they want people to be sick. But I think ultimately it is all down, down to control because that is that is the primary you know, um, uh, characteristic of, of a psychopath. Is absolute and utter control as a result of absolute and utter paranoia. Because those smart meters could actually cause cancer because of the radiation by using it for else. Oh, I'm not saying that. 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 I'm and did she ever get around to suing you? And this is Tony Far this is Tony Farrell. Tony, hi! <laughs> hi. Did you get that right? Uh, my question uh, my first question is Tamsin Allen of Leveson Inquiry Fame, the super lawyer. Did she ever get around to suing you? Following no. my appearance last year. No, no, it all stayed de uh, deathly quiet and, and um, I uh, well, we always run on the basis that when these people don't go for us, we must be uh, saying stuff that's true. Um, but her name came up, obviously, in, with Leveson, but it also came up in something else, and I'm racking my brains to think what it was. Uh, there definitely seemed to be um, something fairly dark, uh, a dark aura about that lady, and uh, no, she hasn't come out and... Uh, and trying to do anything. Well, it was a leading question to um, to to other gen more general questions. The first general question I'd like to ask is: 
How problematic, from your perspective, is infiltration within the truth movement where cases like the Holly Gregg case uh, that have a huge potential to expose judicial corruption and police corruption uh, are very much undermined by truth movement groups who um, were schisms, of course. I myself have been, um, you know, as you know, an awful well have been experiencing quite a schism with my particular stances um, in support of Miss Seven's case. But in terms of um, the truth movement in general, you, you opened the show talking about the growth in, the, you know, in Plymouth and we were talking about Sheffield, but we've got stronger communities elsewhere in the United Kingdom. And, and I uh, would question the integrity of many of the groups um, that have been founded. Well, obviously, um, Tony, your background is well placed to ask a question like that. And I'm going to say you, you've already got a good answer lined up, I'm sure. Uh, what I would say is that uh, we should be encouraged uh, when we start to see the activities of the disruptors and the trolls. Uh, because if, if we weren't doing anything that worried the other side, they wouldn't have to uh, spend time and effort trying to get in amongst the groups and disrupting them. And, causing friction and getting everybody at each other's throats, which are the standard tactics. So the fact that we, we've experienced these attacks, uh, we talk to other groups that know something is wrong, one or two individuals appear and then all the relationships start to break down. I think the first thing we've got to say to ourselves is this is good, it's positive, because it, it tells us that we're actually hurting the bad guys. So that's the positive side. The second point is that I think we can deal with this sort of stuff quite easily uh, because they always use template tactics. Uh, so the, the common thing will be to get one or two people into the inner circle of any sort of organization. And then, as I just mentioned, they generally work to cause friction and break down the team, teamwork, spread false rumours, make false accusations until everybody is buzzing with it. But the most dangerous part of it, I think, comes over the, uh, the electronic world because we see people who are getting close to the point where they think life is in their computer. Uh, they, they're in amongst them, um, hundreds or thousands of emails, uh, that is where they think real life is. People are emailing each other, criticising each other, having arguments. And then if we think the email ether is bad enough, then we've got to go into something like Facebook, where people are living that electronic existence. And the danger with that, in my opinion, is not, a, is not human trolls, real people, that have been tasked to get in amongst those, net, uh, those Facebook circuits. We, know, we now know we're dealing with operators who can create and control a number of electronic personalities. So you will be having a spat with a person, you think it's a person, but actually you're having a spat with an electronically generated person. So one operator can control, say, 20 of these electronic personalities, and therefore if they get into a big electronic group, they can cause a lot of problems very quickly. So I think a major part of our tactic is the natural thing. We're human beings, we work best when we're together, when we can see other people face to face, we can see what the reactions are, so forming small groups is important and one of the things I've always said is that keep everything loose. You don't want to have a group where it's all formalised and regimented. Uh, keep it loose, let people work with other people they feel comf uh, comfortable with and that's the best environment to bowl out people who come along, they seem okay and then people say, I'm a bit suspicious about that person. Oh, are you? I've been feeling the same. It's, it's that sort of intuition that bowls them out. And the other 
so keep the thing loose. Um, you don't need to keep huge databases of people. It's best if you don't. And our policy has always been to people to say, only work with people you feel comfortable with. So if somebody calls us and they're isolated in part of the country and they want somebody else to be in communication with, we will pass them some other names and contact details, but we always say to them, uh, if you get on, that's fine, you work together, and if you don't, don't bother about it. Because if you work with people you trust and you, you, you feel confident about, you quickly bowl out the people who don't seem to fit the bill. Um, there was another, just one more point. And the, the other one I'd like to just add in with that is this business about surveillance. Um, it is absolutely true that the state is monitoring, the, I, I would say, of all the activists, and that includes us, we are monitored 24 hours a day. If we pick up a telephone, if we send an email, Twitter, tweet, they are absolutely watching what we do. Um, they've got all this fantastic computing capability, but if you want to deal with a state surveillance system, we need 10 million people sending 100 emails a day. The way you deal with it is you swap these people out. It is very, very easy because it doesn't matter how much computer surveillance they use, eventually the data has got to be put in front of a human operator. Uh, Tony knows because he was one. And the limitation is on the number of people they employ. And although when they were in Parliament, the head of MI5, 6 and GCHQ was, was sort of saying, well, we've got people and they're not earning a lot of money and they're working very hard trying to protect the nation. There was some half truth in that because um, my, I'm going to say my experience, my intuition tells me that the average surveillance operator they're using is going to be a young person in their mid-late 20s, early 30s, and they're heavily reliant on those people to monitor the likes of people like us. So keep it loose, keep it human, don't keep records. It's a bit like the resistance, isn't it? Working cells. And don't talk less, talk more. We're, we're not planning anything nasty. Uh, we're gonna deal with these people in a reasonable, common sense way. So we've got nothing to hide. And who knows, in talking openly, we might actually wake up some of their operators. Yeah, just going back to, to uh, the, like, the hate campaigns that go on, I, I was subjected to one and it affected me really, really bad just by one guy who had multiple things across Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah, multiple sort of it. And um, at first it really, it really affected me and um, now I, I don't care. I, I believe that you know this, this group of people have let you know um, left me alone because I haven't given energy to it. But they do. They, they I mean, they, they were vicious. They, they they looked at who my partner was. They then got involved with my partners, who they believe were his brother and sister, but he just had enlisted. They were friends. He'd known for 25 years. Befriended these people and started stirring up all the trouble complete lies, cause a rift between myself and my partner because you know he saw it as Facebook. This is what this is what they try to do, but the more energy you give these people, the more they'll do it. But what's upsetting is it's when the people that you've been friends with online and you think they're to support you, you've got these individuals that are downright out for trouble. They have the power to, you know, you get into the minute you engage conversation with them, they have the programs that they have these little systems where they can change your conversation to what you're saying. You know, that they have all these tools here and you, you can't win, so you just literally, you have to sidestep it completely. You know you're right. If the people that, you know, suddenly, all, all of a sudden are going to go and turn against you, you know, you, you, you literally feel sorry for them because of the weakness, but you can't, you can't win with people like that. You just literally have to shut the door, energy goes where energy flows and just leave it and... I'm, I'm a true believer uh, of the goodwill prevail, and you know you're, you know you're doing something right. You believe it in yourself. These people, there are ulterior motives behind it. There are other reasons behind it, 
and they, they will suck in, they will go to extraordinary lengths to try and discredit you, but that's the, it's because you're doing something right and you're, you're in pushing buttons. Okay, there's just one final comment I'd like to make, Brian, and it's just be, uh, obviously close to my heart is the police service. And from my vantage point, what I'm observing is more and more people at lower levels are willing to speak out a little bit. Um, not necessarily come out of the service yet, but I was wondering about, from your vantage point in the UK column, since perhaps we spoke a, a few years on ago on this, have you, have you made any observations about police coming forward with information um, and being dissatisfied with the way policing in the UK is going? Uh, well, I'm going to say absolutely no doubt about it. Um, there is a, I think, a significant change amongst the police. Um, our best example of that was um, Bilderberg, um, where the whole time that operation was on, we were talking to the, uh, to the police men and women on duty. And um, uh, one of the best comments we had from one of the ladies was um, that when she knew she was going to be posted to the Bilderberg, event she decided to go online to see what people were talking about and uh, she, she, she then said to me um, and it's scary and, and I said to her do you mean that we're all scary and she said no I began to realize what you're talking about and that's scary so we got some quite heartfelt comments from the police they were particularly well informed and concerned about big companies like G4S and Serco starting to take their jobs away and they were also upfront enough to say of course we shouldn't really be talking to you but the barrier was down because you know we had good um, enjoyable conversations with them and um, uh, we, we, I'd like to say to you that you know the phone's ringing every few days with another policeman giving us information, but it doesn't it doesn't quite work like that. It's um, you get a bit of information, or somebody will say to you, "I've got a friend who's a policeman, and he's telling me that amongst his team they're now looking at this information or that information." Um, uh, Ian Crane, same sort of story with. Uh, the police effort around the fracking uh, in the southeast. He said that when, when he spoke to the police, they were very interested in what the demonstration was about, and they were particularly fascinated that the demonstrators were overwhelmingly ordinary people. So I, I think we're starting to see some interesting things happening in the police. Um, on a serious note, there are a lot of police very concerned about the increase in suicides amongst police men and women. Um, and I can also tell you that the little booklet on the dangers of the Tetra mast system, I'm going to embarrass myself and say I can't, I can't remember the name of the gentleman who wrote it, even though I've done an interview with him. Bar Barry Trower, his name is. Uh, he produced a very good booklet warning of the dangers of the Tetra system and the fact that there's now a significant number of police who are suffering from cancers, in particular cancer of the, the shoulder neck area as a result of carrying their, their mobiles in that position. Um, but it's clear that the police are, are, uh, are worried about those sorts of issues. They're worried about their jobs with the security, private security services, and, um, and they're beginning to talk. The last story I'll give you, because it's one that I got a lot of pleasure from, um, and this was going back about three, maybe four years, a man came into the UK column office, and he wanted to talk to me about a problem he was having with Southwest Water. And it was an interesting story, because basically he was talking about being seen off by, by the water company, but the story went on a bit, and I'd got some other things to do. And then he said to me out of the blue, well, that wasn't really what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to tell you that, that one of the people helping me is a lady police officer. And on a Friday night, she shows your videos where you're talking about common purpose. And she has a beer and wine evening, and they show, show you videos. And I said to him, and what, they have a good laugh. 
And he said, oh no, they're very interested in it. And when they've watched the video, she sends it to a colleague of hers who's in the Midlands, so totally different police force, obviously. And um, there's a small group of them doing the same thing there. So, you know, that was, that struck me four years ago. I believe that at the moment we, we are all, not just the UK column, we're all having a much bigger effect than we think we are. And I believe that a good measure of the success we're all having is the fact that we, we can see very easily that everything is speeding up. You'll see more and more of the nefarious government activities being thrown at us, whether it's to do with jobs, or, or whether it's the close down of the NHS or it's bringing in private security firms, they are rushing, and the reason they're rushing is they know people are waking up. Tony, do you want to, uh, do you want to come back on any of that, or should we? Yeah, okay. Um, Tony, sorry, Tony, just can I, sorry. Please. Yeah, go ahead, Brian, go ahead. Yeah. Can I just say, Tony, we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to speak to you if, um, if, uh, you feel able to, however, give us a maybe a Skype conversation or something, but there's there's quite a few bits to catch up on. Yeah, yeah, I've been meaning to get in touch, but I have been in, well, underneath the radar for a while, but I, I'm out now and I'm uh, up in Sheffield for the time being. And well, throwing the bucket at the police commissioner and so the Yorkshire Police, uh, the Achilles heels of the police service. Yeah, there, there's, there's a fine example, isn't it? Because we were doing some um, good work together a little while ago. I think what we did had an impact. Um, you then had some other business to do, so you went off and did it. We got on and did our thing. So we're working as a team, but um, certainly MI5 would have had trouble working out what you were doing with us because we, we haven't got a clue ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be in touch in the next week then, Brian, right? okay? <laughs> That's a promise. Just, just before we uh, move on to the next question, sorry, this is Aidy again. Um, uh, somebody very, very close to me just retired from the police on my birthday, wasn't me. Um, and I asked him about how he enjoyed his retirement. He said, "Oh, great! I was counting down the months from ten years ago. Um, most of the bodies that he would call proper bodies are all counting down the paychecks until they retire." And all of the police officers, um, who he called Robo Spaz, uh, which I thought was quite a hard-hitting word to use, um, don't even realise. And that was somebody who, not, he wasn't actually in South Yorkshire, um, I say he's retired, and another member of his family is due to retire shortly, and they are literally ticking off the paychecks. So the guys who have been in for years, I think they've got more of an idea of what's going on and they don't like the fact that jobs are being taken away. You find that prison officers are in exactly the same situation. I know a couple of prison officers up in Doncaster um, and they're exactly the same. They've just got big companies coming in. All of their terms and conditions are changing. Everything that they joined the job for is gone. And, and the probation service, of course. Absolutely. And um, just one other thing, you came up with common purpose. Um, this time last year I was at a bonfire party, which would, I would describe as a, um, an upper-class bonfire party that I ended up at. And uh, this chap next to me, who was very sort of plumbing mouth, was discussing things with me. And I said, uh, well, we, we have all got one common purpose, of course. And I thought he was going to choke on his mulled wine, which I found really, really funny. Anyway, who's the next one in the room with a question for the guys down at UK Common? Hands in the air. Go on. Hi there, Brian. It's Jason again. Uh, right, right back to where we started from. Um, and my question is regarding the uh, mainstream media. Do you think that the mainstream media is a symptom of the system, or do you think it is a part of the system um, that is deliberately implemented? I'll go for that. Yeah. Um, I actually think that there are, just like every organisation, there are good and there are bad people working in that organisation. Do I think that they're a symptom or a part of the system? I think if you're looking at the way, the way that they, that they're, they're set up, i.e. a pyramid system, that quite clearly isn't the system, isn't it? It's a pyramid system. And I can, I can totally agree with people who say that certain editors are put into certain positions in order to make sure the stories get, you know, get, get air or get not. Although I would probably say that the legal profession is mostly that, that, that sort of like go between now. Um, 
But I, I would just, I, I, there are a lot of people in our movement now, in our, our sort of, I, I never really know what to term it, the alternative media, I suppose, um, who think that the mainstream media is purely evil and everything they do is wrong, everything they do is, 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 you know, is, is misinformation. I just don't believe that. I, I believe there are some really good um, uh, reporters and investigative journalists who are working in these organisations. The problem generally is the legal team, that's as far as the story will get before it gets banned back. Um, so, I, I think in the short answer, yes, they're part of the system. In the long answer, no, they're just a symptom and there are good people working in those organisations. Mike? Uh, I would add that uh, uh, Brian and I were doing, a, or Brian was doing the talk and I was there uh, in South Wales uh, and there was a journalist at the talk and uh, you know, Brian was asking him some fairly searching questions about why, why does the mainstream media not do this, why do they not do that? And his, his answer was very simple. He said he, he gets up in the morning, he goes into work, he has eight or ten stories he has to write during the day. He doesn't have time to think. He simply rehashes, I mean, ultimately what he was saying is he simply rehashes press releases, uh, you know, rewrites them in, in, the, in the style of the newspaper and publishes them. Uh, the impression that I got from speaking to him is that really uh, the, there, there was no uh, investigative journalism uh, being done in the mainstream media anymore, except in very few cases. Uh, they don't have the funding for it, they don't have the uh, time, time for it. And I mean, uh, 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 I, think, I think that uh, the possible exception to that, um, and we can offer plenty of criticism of the Daily Mail, but the poss possible exception to that is the Daily Mail. So for example, um, when the Daily Mail published what they published about Levison, uh, they published um, Pretty, the, the story they published was pretty much the story we gave them. So, so we had published uh, the, the, the UK column that came out with, with Levison on the front page was in, in January or February, I think it was the January 2012 edition. Uh, and and uh, that was read by the Daily Mail. And the Daily Mail clearly then put a team of people on that story uh, who then went off and verified what we had written. It took them seven or eight months to do that, so it was, it was October or November before they published that story in the, in the Daily Mail. Um, and they had clearly gone, taken what we had done, they'd added some additional information of their own, and they published 14 pages on it. Um, and uh, um, so they clearly have, um, under certain circumstances, the resources to put uh, into a, a team, whatever size that team is, of people uh, to do some investigative uh, work. But I don't see too much of that from very from uh, very many of the other uh, newspapers. They they simply take and the Daily Mail does this as well. Of course, they simply take uh, the, the the government press release of the day, or they take the uh, the the table of contents from the Radio Four Today program in the morning, and that sets a news agenda for the day. And, and of course, the Daily Mail um, is also pushing a lot of uh, celebrity. Uh, news out as well, which has no no useful purpose at all. So, other than to, to hopefully for them sell the newspapers. But so, um, the, the original question was: Is it a symptom of the of the system, or is it part of the system? I think it's both. Um, but I, I think I think the fact that that uh, um, the economic reality of, of these days of of where we're living at the moment has has. Uh, Forced newspapers to cut back and cut back and cut back on, on their investigative capability, and you end up with with something which uh, with a, a media which is not capable of of, uh, of actually producing any investigations and any serious reports. Can I just add a bit as well? I totally agree with what Mike's just said, and and the publicity for the Mail, uh, the Telegraph, and the Sun um, on uh, common purposes effect on Leveson. Uh, was really encouraging, and the fact that particularly the mail has continued to dig uh, over Leveson and and to highlight common purpose still being there at work while they attempt to get this thing through the Privy Council, that's, that's been very encouraging. Uh, but the other thing I want to say is um, it's, it seems to us more and more that we, we, and I mean that in a broad sense, that anybody that's pumping out truth and information over the internet is really causing the mainstream press and media problems. Because 
their own journalists, of course, go and read blogs at coffee time or when, when they're at home. So their own people are now picking up information from what people are saying over the internet. And therefore the internet, I think, is slowly but steadily starting to drive the mainstream media. What, what I would like to see is, is, the, is the wider activist group staying focused on a smaller number of subjects where they stay on message. Uh, because, for example, if they stick on a message that David Cameron and his government is utterly corrupt, uh, he is corrupt, his ministers are corrupt, uh, they lie to us, they deceive people, uh, we've got people who can't feed themselves, that is a very, very powerful argument which simply, how, how does a Tory media machine counter what millions of people are just openly discussing on the internet? So I think that if, if we could encourage um, activists in, it doesn't matter what their primary reason for doing things is, but, you know, they may be anti-fracking people, they may be interested in health or food, uh, doesn't matter what it is in the primary sense, but if they could stay on the message with a few other subjects, we'd really be getting somewhere much quicker. Syria was a very good example. People started to talk to each other, and the message was very clear. The government's fooled us once over weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we're not going to be fooled again over, over Syria and the call for an attack on Syria. So we, we know that um, many MPs were shocked by the sorts of messages they received from constituents with people simply saying to them, you vote for an attack on Syria and we will work to take your seat away, which is exactly the message we should be giving them. So um, I, I think it will be good to see a little less of talking about some subjects which may be true, but they're a little bit nefarious. And I would like to see more of the activist groups concentrating on the bread and butter stuff, that we've got criminals in Westminster, we've got fraudsters and criminals in the banks, we've got paedophiles amongst the judiciary in the, the Westminster elites, and we need to get rid of these people and replace them by good people. I think that's a much more powerful message than if we start to say, well, we've got to deal with the Illuminati, because where does that take us? Well, who are they? We could then have a 10-hour discussion. I, I just wanted to add a footnote on what we're discussing here, and I just say that the BBC is the absolute exception to the rule. They are completely part of the system, in my mind. Uh, I, I was, had the pleasure, thank you very much, Lou, of reading the BBC uh, editorial policy today which is a fantastic and riveting read, as you can imagine. Um, but one thing that did really stark out to me was that the BBC will not take information from a third party. And what they class as a third party is basically anybody who is not government, essentially. Right? So the BBC will only push forward stories without any sort of credible research if it's coming from the government. If it comes from a third party, they won't even consider it. They won't even consider it. And that's what it says in their, in their editorial policy. So what that tells me is that the BBC is actually providing a function. And it's a function of government. And if we're talking about a system, it's a system of the elites and it's administered through government. And so I really see the BBC is absolute exceptions to the rule. Whereas I would say that there are, there are some very, you know, there are some very uh, good journalists, my, I think, are out there. But I think for in the BBC, I think they're just monkeys who are getting paid to do a job and they're doing what they're told to do. And they don't have time to even think or even do anything because they just have to follow the policy. And as they say, I've read it and it is incredibly boring, but very insightful. And of course, because of the unique way that the BBC is funded, we're all expected to pay for it. Otherwise, we get two big grizzly guys knock on the door and ask us why we can pay our TV license for them to corrupt our brains for us. Uh, can, I add, uh, can I add on that? Sure, yeah. Subject to the BBC, because we are very, very interested in the BBC. Um, if, if any of your um, group um, tonight are not aware about these, these commercial sections of the BBC, I'd encourage you to have a look at it. I, I'm beginning to think that what's going on at the moment is they want to collapse 
the uh, publicly funded part of the BBC, the, the licensed part of the BBC that most people think is the whole of the BBC. But of course, if you look into it, you, you've got these other BBC companies, you've got BBC Global and BBC Worldwide um, operating between the two of them on about £1.2 billion. Pounds. So the BBC is already absolutely in the private uh, media sector and therefore uncontrollable. Um, they are talking about their share of the global viewing market. And uh, BBC documents that we've looked at show the BBC congratulating themselves that on one occasion they reckon their, their viewers um, were near 600 million people. So you can see the BBC heading towards becoming the global news system, the global propaganda system. And the other part of the BBC I'd encourage people to look at is the so-called charity BBC Media Action. It's anything but a charity because all of its funding comes from either British government sources or overseas government, governments. And if you look at their own documentation, they are talking about getting into emerging or vulnerable overseas states in order to help them establish democracy. <laughs> now, one thing that would scare me is anybody in the BBC saying they're helping set up democratic systems. We don't think that's what they're doing. We think what the BBC is actually doing is providing the broadcasting communications for agitators in foreign countries and of course the BBC through media action has been boasting of their work in uh, Kenya, Somalia, uh, Egypt, Libya and, um, and Syria as well. So it is an amazing coincidence that everywhere we're starting to see this so-called Arab Spring under the surface is the BBC. And if I can really twist the knife, of course, the other organisation that's under the surface is Common Purpose, operating as Common Purpose in Libya to help, to help the Libyans rebuild their public sector infrastructure in a democratic way. Um, but in um, Egypt and, and other Arabic areas, uh, Common Purpose is operating under the title of Al-Fala, uh, which I understand is Arabic for White House. So it's, it's a quite extraordinary combination and we can tie the two together because the BBC uh, has got thousands of common purpose trained people in it, uh, but they have refused to disclose the names or the total numbers of the people trained. Um, on our Common Purpose Exposed website, uh, I think there's one section which shows about 400 BBC names. Uh, but probably two or three years ago, I was contacted by a lady who said she was a BBC employee. She was very nervous. She asked me how many Common Purpose people I thought. Uh oh. Uh oh. 100, you know, maybe 600. And she said to me, straight off, Brian, there are thousands. And uh, I hope that she was going to come back with some further information, but she didn't. Uh, but if you think you know what the BBC is, go and have a look at BBC Media Action. Go through, look at their trustees and what their background is. It's um, uh, an eye-opener, really. Yeah, we've got lots of common purpose in general, as you can well imagine. Um, just staying with the media, um, David Icke is um, in the throes of going uh, live with his people's voice, and I can see a big smile on Brian's face already. Um, what's your thoughts? What can I say? Is, is it... I'm, I'm, my, I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to say, uh, you've said it for me, uh, because we're, we're gently watching to see quite how it develops and what direction it's, it's going to go in. Um, I will say quite openly that uh, we had an invite to 
uh, to get involved, um, which was very kind of David Icke, but he gave us that opportunity. Um, but what, what we wanted to know at a fairly early stage was um, how the programming was going to be controlled. And um, what, I, what I wanted to know, what, what my kid wanted to know as well, is, is would, for example, the UK column uh, style be put next to something which was perhaps interesting to people who were waking up, but a little bit more difficult to pin down, a bit more theory and a bit less factual. Because um, we may be small, the UK con may be small, but we do know that we've actually got a, a brand which is working. My little joke is that I often wear a shirt and tie because that means that I'm a proper person who can be trusted. And we need to be sure. <laughs> well, we can discuss that. <laughs> but, and, and Ian Crane's got a very good expression. He says that if we're going to really have the effect we need, we've got to talk to Middle England. Yeah. And, and so we are trying to talk to Middle England. If I'm sat with a group of people, we're having a private discussion. I don't mind what we talk about. But if, um, if we're, we're live and we're broadcasting, We've wanted to stay uh, a fairly wide, excuse me, a fairly wide road, but we want to stay talking to Middle England because these are the people we think we need to wake up. And unfortunately, we couldn't quite get the reassurance that what we're producing would be necessarily not mixed with other things, other areas that we don't want to go near. I'm giving you a diplomatic answer because I accept that, I accept that. There's, there's enough trouble getting people working together as it is. Um, but we decided we'd sit and wait and watch. If David Icke makes a success of what he's doing, I can say well done to David Icke. But at the moment, UK Column just wanted to um, stay with our own brand. Mike? Uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> right. Uh, I just, can I just say where we're going to start in? No, I, I know what I'm going to say, okay. I'm just wondering which, where to start, but anyway. Uh, um, I, uh, they clearly have uh, a budget that which uh, I would envy because we certainly didn't have that budget. Well, don't. Uh, still don't. Yeah. I just said you were uh, tenant. I had a bought a t-shirt from you. Well, in fact, I did and I'm wearing it. Get a bumper sticker. No, I'm not, I got a bumper sticker now. I think they could have spent the uh, budget a lot more wisely. I think that uh, um, it's pretty clear that that uh, some of the comments that they have made in the last uh, few weeks imply that they have uh, spent most or all of that money already before they before they even started making any programs. Um, I think that um, I was really surprised and um, somewhat shocked and uh, uh, disappointed, shall we say, that that. Uh, one of the first announcements that was made on Sunday evening is that they were applying for a, a license from Ofcom, which, uh, in my view, number one, uh, means that they are entering into a contract with Ofcom, uh, which will absolutely uh, um, regulate what they're doing. And I think that they, he's either been somewhat naive to do that, or he's been very badly advised, um, because Ofcom at this point has no uh, jurisdiction over internet content uh, and in fact the, this issue of internet content being uh, regulated by Ofcom is still being discussed in the House of Lords and other places so there was still there was still time he didn't he didn't have to do that I believe um, um, they, so uh, now the reason that, that I'm particularly disappointed that he's done that is because it, it, a it sets a precedent uh, for people that are broadcasting and uh, uh, webcasting on the internet, but but uh, aside from that, um, uh, there are you know Edge Media and PSTV were both effectively shut down, um, and uh, who, who's the who's the other um, program that was on showcase with PSTV? Rich Holly. Um, oh, Richard Richard D Hall. Richard D Hall was also taken off the air. So there's three examples of people that were broadcasting our type of material uh, that were taken off the air as a, uh, through a direct intervention of Ofcom with the people that owned the channels. 
Um, and uh, in the case of uh, uh, in the case of Richard D. Hall, it was one complaint. Now, uh, Edge Media had a guy working for them uh, that um, was that knew the Ofcom regulations inside out, and because obviously because they were broadcasting on Sky channels, they were uh, obliged to be licensed under Ofcom rules. Um, and so, in most in most cases, uh, Edge Media was able to, to deal with uh, any problems that Ofcom had with what with the programming they were putting out. Uh, as far as I know, David Icke does not have that type of uh, uh, person working with him. I think that uh, he sold the, the channel as being an uncensored, uh, free uh, uh, program, pre uh, channel pushing out free content. Uh, and I think he's going to find a very different picture emerging over the next few months as he uh, uh, sits on his new license uh, and uh, begins to understand the implications of, of what he's done. But, uh, but uh, as well as that, there, there may be implications for other people that are trying to push out similar, um, similar information on the internet, including us. And, and we just have to wait and see how that pans out. So I think that, that you know, I'm impressed with what they've done uh, in, in the time that they've done it. Uh, it, it, I would have expected that they did a, a, a job as good as that on the basis of the amount of money that they had, but nonetheless, uh, um, they've, done a, they've done a good job, they've got a nice studio, they've got nice offices. Um, we'll see what the programming is like uh, after the 25th of, uh, of November when they finally start pushing out um, programs, but I think the Ofcom business is, is quite a uh, significant uh, situation. We have to keep a close eye on. Thank you very much for that, Mike. Um, um, do, do, does anybody else have a question? Uh, there we go, now, just a second. I have to go, I have to go now, so I'm oh, Mike's, okay. gonna come, Mike's gonna come and sit um, here. But nice talking to you all, and good luck, and keep it all up, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. Bye. Mine's better looking anyway. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we've got, um, we've, I think you, the next question will be from somebody that you might be aware of. He, he goes by the name of um, Mark. You might recognise his Mike accent. Yeah, you've not met me before, Mike, but um, I just wanted to really see you uh, sat there, see if you had a blue jumper on as usual to fit into your studio. <laughs> 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 well, the missus is a bit in your one, she's not even that old because she cares about you that much, but um, oh, oh good. <laughs> um, I mean, it, I got here quite late tonight, I was trying to help some people to get here, you find it quite difficult. Um, so I did miss uh, more or less the first hour. Um, I totally uh, agree with everything that's been said, um, especially with the media. Um, but I don't know whether it's been mentioned that I'd like to emphasise on about, because I've had it personal in the last sort of 72 hours, about when we get a little bit lost with the facts and how people run, with the information that's been spread uh, amongst, as, as, like, as in wildfire really. Uh, people sort of like run with that about doing the research and, you know, and these things really become quite, um, they get in the way of us all getting together and getting the facts together and then empower ourselves to do something about it eventually. Um, so, could you, um, I don't know if you mentioned that tonight, but would you like to emphasise on that, please? Thank you, Simon. Have I understood that properly? Essentially, you're, you're saying, um, are, people, are people doing the right big things and going into the right depths?